<laughs> All right, we are live, and John is laughing, and Damien is waking up. Oh, my <laughs> I'm waking up. I have a lot of morning. It's another Monday, except it's Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> it is the ASP.net community stand up, and that beard was driving me insane. I had to get rid of it. So I figure uh, Damien and Galloway are bald, so I might as well just be bald as well. Mm. Mine's actually going. This is, I haven't shaved mine in a while now. So. Yeah, it's getting a little fuzzy on top there. Yeah. Well, I, the top and the bottom. All right. I did a um, I did a Microsoft Virtual Academy thing where I shaved a uh, yeah, kind of halfway goatee between two sessions, and then <laughs> that's totally a good idea. Just to mess people. Mess yeah. people. <laughs> no. All right, John. What's our community? Uh, what's going on in the community right now? All right. Yeah. Let me share that their screen. Um, so first of all, um, all right. There it is. So Stephen Walter. Uh, Continuing, he's been doing a lot of great posts, so this one is a deep dive on routing, or routing, as they say in some countries, so that's cool. Uh, Mark Rendell, uh, with a, with, he's been doing a series on Linux and Docker, running ASP.NET with Linux and Docker. So um, one other one I wanted to point out is that, you know, we're starting to see more stuff going on on Stack Overflow on the ASP.NET 5 list. So this specific one, common question on debug release transforms um, and you know how we do that now that we're not doing those uh, release transforms and you know good answer here but mostly I just wanted to point out that there there is some good discussion going on here on the on the questions as they're starting to pick up um, David Fowler tweeted that there is a new file system globbing and I have no idea actually what that actually even means but globbing sounds cool I'm using that right now in the oh, Globbing is super cool. All you need to know about globbing is like slash star star slash, and then you go. Ah, oh. uh, right. That's what that is. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All it's, right. It's way better than star dot star. Cool. Uh, here's a cool thing from Rui. Uh, he's um, this is a continuous test runner thing. So he's he's packaged up the come on K M O N thing. And he's got a K command, and it'll watch a folder and then continuously run tests. So I just thought that was kind of neat. So, so, so slow down a little bit. So come on, Kmon yes. is the K-mon. version of Nodemon, which watches the folder and then kicks the process when something changes. Yep. Saying KCT, which has no good way to pronounce it, now watches yeah. a folder and then does tests. Continuously run tests, and I think he's got this one hooked up to X unit. Um, but that is really, really cool, actually. Yeah, pretty slick. Um, so, and then one last one here. This is from Frank Kruger, and he did a um, big post. This is just kind of core CLR, but he did a big post on running core CLR on OS X, and there's some good discussion going on about this on uh, on Hacker News and stuff. So, I love Frank Kruger. Such a yes. nice guy. Frank Kruger wrote Kelka. Ah. C-A-L-C-A. It's an amazing, amazing... Markdown based calculator app. Little uh, little random advertisement there. Free this episode of the Ace. We didn't have to <laughs> and McDonald's. Cool. <laughs> Anything else, John? That's it. All right, cool. Demo. Uh, so, beta 3 is done. Um, release is imminent. So, look for that in the next uh, week or so. Um, there's a bunch of new stuff in beta 3. We get the uh, cache, finally. We have uh, caching available in uh, MVC and the underlying framework in beta 3. There's some new tag helpers. I think I spoke about the last week, the environment tag helper and the cache tag helper that allows you to use the new cache system to cache fragments of cache is views. really cool. Can you draw that on the board behind you? What's this? A caching fragment is pretty amazing. Oh, yeah. Show me that. So, I can have like a block of HTML. Um, it might have some calls to some HTML helpers. Maybe you can zoom in on that. Yeah, sure. Can you read that? I can change color if need be. Better, not the best color. Yeah, I'd to get a better color. Oh, I can see reflections of us on the thing. How's that? that better? Yeah, that's way right. better. Red is lovely. Okay. Yep. So you can have a fragment of uh, you know, any HTML. It doesn't matter what it is. And then you can have you know, any other razor, so you can have calls 
to you know, raise the methods here or you know, whatever it might be. And then if you want this block to only run, you know, um, not every time, you want to cache the result of this block, which is just HTML, right? You can wrap this in a cache tag helper, and then that block will effectively run once for the life of the application and get stored in memory. Now, it wouldn't be much use unless you could do all the normal types of caching things, like um, expire the content based on a time or a sliding window, or perhaps set up a trigger so that you can invalidate the content based on um, some other event taking place, like a database record changing or a file changing. Um, or perhaps you um, want to vary the cache result so that different users get different cache results depending on what browser they're using or whether they're logged in or not or whether a query string is present. So we have all that support. So there are just attributes on the cache you can say, you know, uh, vary by, it just lets you vary by anything. So in here, you just put in a call to you know, whatever you want, and that string will be used to, to construct the cache key. Um, but we also have first class attributes, so you can say you know, vary by cookie, uh, for example, or header or query, and then you can put in a cookie name here, and then we'll take the value of that cookie and use that as the cache key or part of the cache key. And as I said, there's cookie, query, header, um, a bunch of other stuff. And then if you want to expire it, it's as simple as saying, you know, expires, I think it's on, and then you can give an absolute date there, or you can say um, expires, uh, there's a whole bunch of different ones, depending on whether you want to do sliding, or whether you want to do absolute, or whether you want to do just some period from now. Um, so there's a whole bunch of those as well. And then if you want to set up programmatic triggers, there's an API that allows you that from inside this block here, you can write code, just like you can in Razor, and you can basically from inside here, you can grab from the current execution context, I can't remember the name of the API, it's something like cache entry link dot something something. You can get access to the context that will be used to create the cache entry for this, and you can add triggers to it. So say, um, you're going to render something from your model here. So rather than add HTML, this was at model dot something. And the, that model was populated from the database. So you want to invalidate this record when something from the database changes. Well, your controller could have not only put the data on the model, but also a cache invalidation trigger that's linked to the thing that built the model. And then inside here, you would effectively just call the API. I can't remember what it is, something to do with cache dot blah. And then you can add that trigger. So then you can just say, you know, call that method and say model dot, you know, say you call the trigger, and pass that in. And what will happen is the cache tag helper will run this once. It'll um, get this trigger that you added to it in the first time it was added. And then it will um, use that trigger as part of the cache entry when it, uh, as part of the HTML that goes in with the cache. So that when that trigger fires, the cache entry gets invalidated, and this will run again. Um, so yeah, it's kind of cool. It uh, makes it nice and easy to do um, fragment caching, which is not something that we've actually had in ASP.NET previously. We've had, obviously, page caching um, and output caching from action results and things like that. But we haven't generally had um, fragment caching. I know some sites do this already. They do it manually. They just you know, uh, write some sort of construct that uses the built-in cache objects. But now we have a first-class feature for it. If you want to know more about it, just go into the MVC repo, go into the issues, and search for cache tag helper. And it's all spec'd up there how it works. And you can have a look at that. Does this cover um, the um, like donut caching thing? You know, So say, for instance, I want to cache. No, it doesn't. All right. So donut <laughs> caching is basically the reverse of this, right. where you cache a large section, but then you punch a hole in the middle of it. This is donut hole caching. This is donut hole caching. <laughs> um, so we don't have a good story for donut caching as yet, and we're still debating about whether it's something that we want to do or not. Um, you know, we have we have a bunch of guys here who have built you know large sites in the past, and there are some opinions flying around as to whether we think donut caching is worthwhile as a first class feature. Someone could certainly build that themselves if they wanted to. Um, but you know, in my experience, I never had a, a, a need for it, um, and certainly some other people. But we'll listen to customer feedback, and we'll determine whether we need to make that a first-class feature. You could put this in a master page 
and bracket caching. You could cache the top and the bottom. Yes, exactly. So mm -hmm. you could put this around the head, for example, of your page and around any you know, leading banner or chrome at the top of your page and then do the same at the footer. And then um, you, know, you effectively get donut caching, but you're using fragment caching, and then there's a section in the middle that isn't cached. Right. Um, donut caching is quite a lot more complicated because you have to have callbacks that are registered such that when something runs that would otherwise be served from cache, you need to retrieve it from cache and then run something else in order to fill in the gap um, so, to compose it all together. So Speaking of... Uh, uh, of callbacks, the question here about cache triggers and the distributed cache model. Like yep. back in the day, we would used to have like SQL Server callback yep. over in like invalidate the distributed cache. What's the yep. distributed caching story? Um, so we have two caching uh, abstractions or interfaces. There's an I memory cache, which is what this is backed by, and then there's I distributed cache, which is separate. So we actually sem like semantically separated those two contracts. Because, uh, again, based on our experience and talking to customers, people use them in different ways, and they want to be able to know, you know, I'm going to put this type of data in distributed cache and this type of data in memory cache. Um, and they both support the concept of triggers. Exactly what triggers are supported all depends on the implementation, not the contract. Um, so the, the contract supports adding triggers, um, but it doesn't you know, stipulate what those triggers are. So um, if you're using uh, like a Redis distributed cache implementation, uh, I imagine it would have some, you know, based on Redis's capabilities, would have some capability for doing a key-based update or trigger. Um, so here's a question here. Can you see my screen if I share my screen to you? Uh, sure. So it Itamar, Itamar on Twitter, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this is negative or positive, Damien Edwards shows a new feature of vNext that violates whatever remained of the MVC pattern. This is kind of a negative tone. Namely, invalidating the cache from view by pinging the model from the view itself. Is that fair? Um, I don't know. I mean, it all depends on you. you there are you could you could have long debates about what's pure, you know, quote pure or unpure MVC. I'm of the opinion that pure MVC is basically useless for building websites. It's great for building APIs, but there's always going to be some level of composition that has to take place in the view engine. Um, what we're talking about here is caching, caching fragments of a view which or composing UI from, um, from the view side of things. The controller has no business in doing that composition generally. In my you know, in pure MVC, the controller determines what action to run and then returns that action. If that action is a view, then that view executes and that view execution may include some type of composition of smaller fragments. Now, if you want to cache some of those fragments, um, you mean you're not caching data, you're caching HTML, you're caching a response, um, then I don't see an issue with having the controller determine the trigger. As I said, in this case, the controller would still be the one building the trigger for you, and then the view is just being dumb and saying, well, I have this trigger, let me add this to the cache so that whenever the data is stale, the cache, uh, the view portion, sorry, the views portion of the cache also gets invalidated. The controller may be doing its own data level caching as well, which is perfectly fine. This is specifically around fragment caching of the view itself. Um, and I said, you know, you can get 10 developers in a room and they can argue till the end of the days about um, whether this is pure or good or not, but this is just a capability. If you don't like it, don't use it. If you do like it, you know, knock yourself out. Okay. All right. Good. That's pretty much my standard answer to anything about is this pure NVC or not. It's like, if you don't like it, don't use it. <laughs> well, I mean, at the same time, though, like, we are trying to listen to the community. In this case, I just shared the screen of a tweet that came out four minutes ago, so yeah. that's feedback. Maybe you can yeah. zoom out. You're blurry suddenly. There you are. Oh, there I am. I mean, this, these are, this is an interesting point, though. Like, when you said, like, well, you know, there's an argument about what's pure and what's not. Of course, people who are purists would say, no, it's pretty clear what's pure and what's not. The question is, why be pure, right? Yeah, and, and, and purity, as I said, for purity's sake. I have, I have opinions, you know, which are based on my experience of doing web development for a long time. And I, in my experience, when doing um, websites, not just APIs, but when you're building UI, um, MVC is problematic. Like, there's no defined pattern within the pure scope of what MVC is for doing page composition. 
Um, and you, again, we, we never had one in MVC. We never had a composition controller. We never had a supermodel. We never had um, all of these various patterns that people come up with in order to solve this, um, this problem in MVC. The closest we had was you could render partials and you could have child actions, which you know, are not pure at all. Having the view call back into an action is certainly not pure MVC at all because in the traditional um, you know, sense of MVC, um, the model, uh, the, sorry, the controller runs first and determines what happens. Um, at the end of the day, I, when I have these discussions with people, I say at the end of the day, you have to remember why the patents exist in the first place. They exist to solve software development problems, um, to solve issues. As long as what you're doing doesn't introduce those issues again, or you're okay with some of those issues being reintroduced again, it doesn't really matter. This is always a personal decision for any software development team as to what patterns they're going to adopt and how strictly they adhere to them based on how they want to solve particular types of engineering issues um, within that group. And you know, I think all these patterns are invented just so we can argue about them forever. <laughs> yeah, this for my this is a this may seem random, but I remember when I learned Delphi for the first time. Mm -hmm. One of my first jobs doing Delphi. I'm writing Delphi and it's the highest level language I could conceive of because I had come from MFC, right? Yeah. So I was a C person, I was a C++ person, and then I was like, oh my goodness, it's Delphi, it's amazing. But I was writing a sound card control panel, yeah. so I immediately dropped into inline assembler. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, this is before drivers, right? I mean, I'm writing Delphi, it's all very high level, it's all very garbage collected, and it's like, and here's some inline assembler that talks to the, uh, the, the sound card. And you could say, well, there, you know, there goes the neighborhood, he's just yeah. dropped into inline assembler. But it was yeah. exactly what I needed to do the job. Was yeah. it not pure? It was yeah. horrible. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, and but in the same, at the same time, you know, on the other side of the but coin, it was also awesome. The, the the patterns are there to help you know maintainability and testability and composability. I mean, they all exist to solve one of these um, fundamental software engineering issues. And as long as you're willing to trade off, in some cases they're not a trade off. They may not look exactly like the pattern when it was invented. But you know, MVC was invented back when all we had was green screens. We didn't even have the concept of UI composition when MVC was first talked about back in the small talk days. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to you have to adapt to what you're building at the time. And we have MVC in the client, which looks somewhat different to MVC on the server when we talk about web as well, um, because you have different levels of state available, and you have a different you know a request means a different thing, or routing means a different thing. The client that one does on the server, we still call it MVC. Um, and thanks, and th and then it, when you start throwing in, you know, APIs, and then the views calling back using JavaScript after yeah, the page has yeah, been rendered, yeah. you know, it's it's all kind of. I mean, I would argue as long as you aren't unnecessarily giving up, you know, composability, maintainability, testability, you know, whatever performance, whatever the things might be, then use whatever, or you know, you're giving up in a way that you're comfortable with. Do whatever you know, do whatever makes you happy, mm -hmm. and you can use the frameworks that we build to be as pure as you like, or just to write the biggest mess of spaghetti code that you can possibly think of, um, that, that's totally up to you. Right? So you are a pragmatist? I like to think myself as a pragmatist. I mean, I've had these arguments. I've gone through phases in my career of being very pure and being big A architect and then going back to being, you know, and I, I always bring it back to sort of the martial some of the martial arts type of um, philosophies and Bruce Lee saying things like, you know, when you first start, a kick is a kick and a punch is a punch, and then once you know a kick isn't a kick and a punch isn't a punch, and then eventually a kick is a kick and a punch is a punch, which is just to illustrate this circle of understanding that we all go through, and once we get a little bit of knowledge, we tend to start thinking differently, and then once we get even more knowledge and we get experience with that knowledge, we tend to go back to being trying to be as simplistic as possible, and then know that we know when to apply certain elements of knowledge um, in our work. I mean, I went through those phases where I tried to use all of my architecture knowledge in every application I did because I had all this great knowledge and all these great patterns to use. And then after time, you kind of realize that you know there's a time and place for those things. Yeah, that was yeah. cool. Let's anyway, bring yeah. out the last few questions and then move along. Yes. Uh, do we have some questions? Sorry. Yeah. So first question here: uh, Will the I memory cache and I distributed cache interfaces be available to Win API? or Owen, or just limited to MVC? Um, that's a great question. I think they're, they're tied to the lower level HTTP abstraction layer. So they're not in MVC. They're underneath right. MVC in ASP.NET sort of base core. 
Um, so you'd be able to use them in, you know, if there's a future version of Nancy that sits on top of our new HTTP abstractions, then you could use the caching stuff in there. So and then obviously in NEC, what's that? This is ASP.NET Core. Yeah, like ASP.NET Core doesn't, you know, the closest we have to the old system web is kind of the, I think it's ASP.NET.HTTP abstractions is the, is the package name, which is the thing that, you know, has our HTTP object model. And that's where the, the caching is kind of in that layer. All right, cool. And uh, cool. will tag helpers be available through at HTML or something similar? Uh, I think they're thinking but, about tag helpers in the context of typing at HTML dot. Mm -hmm. Right, so at HTML. Where do tag helpers uh, hang off? Yeah, no, so tag helpers, obviously, you invoke, as we've talked about, you invoke tag helpers using HTML syntax. Um, Whereas at HTML, the HTML is just a property. It's just a class. It's just an object, I should say. And it can be anything you like now. Um, by default, it's an instance of an IHTML helper um, class, which has some uh, methods on it, which we you know, refer to as HTML helpers. HTML helpers aren't particularly magic. All they are is methods that you call from your Razor file. Um, whereas tag helpers are actually a new Razor construct um, that happens at parse time when the page is actually parsed and then compiled into a class. There's understanding of which elements are tag helpers or have tag helpers associated with them and which ones don't. So it's a you know it's actually a, a low level construct in Razor now. So they're, they're, they're different things, but they can be backed by the same logic. Yeah. So I think that and that the question it sounds like the the main thinking behind it is can I expect like if there's something that's exposed in a tag helper, should I expect that I should also be able to call a, a helper off of it? Like, Sometimes. Um, so it's certainly for all the form helpers that we have, so you know, text box, drop down list, and all that type of stuff. We there we have tag helpers for those, and we have the traditional HTML helpers, and they're all backed by the same logic. Mm -hmm. um, so in those cases, they, they basically mirror one to one. Um, for things like cache, um, cache currently is a tag helper only. I don't think we have a fragment cache because that's a little bit harder to do as a HTML helper. It is possible. For example, we do it with um, form. With right. The, uh, using HTML .begin, you know, using form, which I never really liked that syntax. It's really just a, a an overuse of the um, disposable pattern to sort of encapsulate two things, and it writes to the request the response stream directly. So it's a little bit icky. Um, but you could theoretically do a cache um, HTML helper like that, but we haven't done that so far. Cool. All right, that's all the questions. I think we're good. Okay, so I just had a couple other things I was going to mention. All right. Uh, the next milestone after the beta 3, which is going to come out soon, is going to be a little bit longer, so it's a chance for us to get a, a bunch more features in that we haven't had time to, uh, to sort of uh, bake yet. Uh, there'll be a bunch more tag helpers coming in the next milestone. You'll see a lot, um, uh, some more features come in that help you to uh, migrate concepts from existing apps over. Uh, I don't want to use the term parity because parity is, it can be misleading, but certainly we're looking at features that are in MVC5 um, and ensuring that we have equivalents in MVC6 or you know, direct ports or make a conscious decision about, no, we're not going to have that in MVC6. Uh, for a specific reason. So you'll see more of those features land in the next milestone. Um, and obviously tooling will continue to get much better as well. Um, we have a servicing story which will be uh, demonstrated in the next milestone as well. Um, and so at some point I'll get the team members in and maybe next week some will talk about how servicing will work um, on ASP.NET 5 as well, given that we have a portable CLR. Uh, which is quite a lot different to the idea of one being installed on Windows. And obviously, we, use, we support OS X and Linux, so how will servicing work on those platforms? It'd be great to talk about that. Um, also, David's been doing a lot of work on startup performance. Um, he was hacking on some code last week, trying to get, uh, I think it was a three-second startup routine, and he got it down to under a second over a period of a few days. And that was um, important to do with the sort of while I'm coding scenario because every time you make a change, we kill the process and it comes back up. We really want that process to be as quick as possible. So we're doing a lot of work in there to try and um, have that you know, that start up from, from nothing to getting to your sort of program main as quick as possible. And I, was, I, was, I was up visiting when I saw some yeah. of that work that he and Lewis were doing with the profiler. What was the profiler they were using? So they were using uh, dot, dot, trace. dot trace. Yeah. So we've tried a couple. Um, 
uh, that they're stuck with dot trace right now and they're having a lot of good success using dot trace. And they were like deep in it, like they were like, "There's 20 milliseconds in that yeah. question. What's going on?" Yeah. Well, they got to the point where because they were doing instrumentation rather than sampling, they could see how many iterations things, you know, how many times the method was being called, and you could, you know, you could identify and say, "Well, why is this taking 20 milliseconds? It really shouldn't." Um, you know, there were larger gains as well. But some of them were really strange, like when you want to start a socket in .NET, um, say the first time you start a socket, if you're, the first thing you do when you app is start a socket, it has to initialize the configuration system in .NET because part of sockets is setting up tracing and tracing can't be set up without config. So there's this ripple effect. And setting up config takes like 200 to 300 milliseconds on his Mac Pro with an SSD. And so what we realized was that, you know what? Maybe just as early on as we possibly can, let's spin up a thread that does nothing but pretend to create a socket. So that by the time we actually do get to create the socket, we've already paid the cost in parallel of spinning up the config system so we don't have to pay it at that point. So a lot of it was just very clever parallelization um, to you know, avoid that first time cost for things on that hot sort of linear path. Um, just doing parallel for parallel's sake so that we could offload that, that work onto a different CPU. So we've got good games that are doing stuff like that. Um, the last uh, couple more things. We started to think about loc and globe um, support in terms of uh, when you're building your ASP.NET 5 applications, how do you support um, you know, uh, different cultures and different languages and those type of things. You know, previously in ASP.NET we had lots of mechanisms whereby the thread culture would be changed based on uh, the browsers mm -hmm. accept language header and all those type of things. So we're looking at how we re-implement some of those features on top of the new stack with a combination of middleware, with a combination of um, some Razor features, maybe a tag helper, and an HTML helper to use localized resources. Um, and then also supporting all things before, like um, doing cookie-based uh, culture or language overrun. Um, easy. I mean, you could do that before we don't derive that code itself. So we're thinking more about um, how we can do that better from the ground up. And then lastly, we've also got a lot of work going on in docs now. Um, so we have a team dedicated to uh, looking at doing documentation, and we have some parallel, simultaneous efforts around different types of documentation um, being spun up, uh, which include you know full-on tutorials where you build a sample app from scratch, something like Nerd Dinner or the Music Store. Um, with a you know, good guided documentation, as well as conceptual documentation, more like the book style, where you go from chapter one to chapter 20, and it takes you through all the elements of the stack piece by piece. Um, and of course, we'll also have reference docs, you know, standard API docs like we always do um, up on MSDN or elsewhere. And I think you've been working on some new ways of um, getting people involved in building the docs, if I'm not Mistake. Yeah, we tweeted a while back about what's the best, what's the word in docs right now, and right now we're exploring Sphinx, uh, and I'm meeting with Read the Docs uh, again uh, tomorrow. Cool. Cool. That, all right. That's all I, had. I think that's our stand-up. So, uh, as always, if you've got questions, you can tweet them, you can put them on YouTube, and we will eventually find them. Uh, you can... Uh, Get involved. Be sure, of course, as always, to check out uh, ASP.NET slash vnext. And from there, you can find the playlists for the community stand-up. You can find the schedule. I do realize we tend to start a little late and things move around. I'm sorry that we don't have this down to a minute-by-minute -minute, uh, thing. A couple people have complained that we start a little bit late. Sorry. sorry. Life happens, meetings happen, travels happens, stuff happens. But we do our best, and we keep showing up, and we hope that you do too. Thanks.